Okay, so let me just sort of summarize what I'm doing and, you know, what is the goal. So first of all, it's a joint work with uh, Martin Marcoli and uh, Ali Shamsevin, and it appeared actually on the archive. So, I mean, the long paper with all the proofs and so on has appeared sometime in October, you know, in the archive. So it can be, I mean, can be seen. Okay, so let me tell you what is the purpose. So the purpose is the following. The purpose is to um, obtain a very simple, extremely simple interpretation of the physics that we know so far uh, by using non-commutative geometry. And I mean, this physics that we know is sort of summarized by Lagrangian. And this Lagrangian is the Lagrangian of Einstein gravity plus the standard model Lagrangian. And, uh, uh, I mean, okay, I don't have to make any propaganda for the complexity of this Lagrangian. I mean, it will show many, many times. But, I mean, the idea is to obtain this uh, Lagrangian from a very, very simple principle, physical principle, and uh, 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 using uh, uh, geometry, okay, but geometry in a slightly different guise than the usual one, namely non commutative geometry. And uh, I mean, the, so the picture that emerges uh, is the following, is that at the microscopic scale of about the inverse of 100 GeV, there is a fine structure in space-time, which is not visible at naked eye, which only shows when you look very, very closely. And this structure is... Uh, not very complicated in the sense that it's just a little bit of discreteness, which shows in saying that the space-time manifold is actually can be modeled locally. I mean, it can be modeled by a product. So it's a product of the ordinary continuum we are used to by a space which is which I denote by f because that space turns out to be finite. By finite, I mean that the algebra of coordinates on that space is finite-dimensional. It's finite dimensional, but it's not commutative. I mean, of course, you know, finite dimensional algebras which are commutative. There are not many. I mean, if you work over C and so on, non commutative ones are not many either, but there is room for interesting ones. And the interesting algebra which comes out, if you want, is complex numbers plus two copies of the quaternions, okay, plus three by three matrices. And what we have shown last time. Okay, which is sort of the starting point of the, the paper with uh, Ali and Mathilde, is that somehow inside this algebra there is a natural one which comes up when you look at the non-commutative geometries for this space. And uh, I mean, so what is, if you want, the setup of geometry that is around? So the setup of geometry which is around is a setup in which a geometry is specified by the algebra of coordinates on the space, which doesn't need to be commutative, and the line element. And when you look at the geometry itself, it is defined by a representation theoretic data. So it's a representation in Hilbert space. So there is a Hilbert space. And in that Hilbert space, you represent on the one hand the algebra of coordinates, and on the other hand the line element, or rather the inverse of the line element, which is called capital D, and which is classically the Dirac operator. Okay, so this is the setup. Now, the principle, so what is the principle, the physics principle, which is a hold? So the physics principle, which is a hold, is that in fact, whatever we measure in a distant universe, or, you know, whatever we measure, even in the very small, is in fact spectral. So it's always some kind of, a, I mean, we know a lot of information about distant galaxies, stars, and so on, just by their spectral. So the principle is that the observables are spectral. And if the observables are spectral, so is the action. So the action is the spectral action. OK. And, uh, and so the spectral action has, if you want, this characteristic property that it's given by spectral invariance of the operator D, which is there. And uh, so what uh, one needs is to select among these spectral invariants those which have the properties that they are additive when you consider disjoint union of spaces, 
And those which are additive when you take disjoint union of spaces have a certain form. This form is a spectral action, which is a trace of a certain function of d. Now, d in physics has a dimension of a mass because it's the inverse of a length. So you have to define, to divide d by uh, some quantity which has dimension of a mass to make it dimensionless. And this is a spectral action. Okay. So now to the spectral action, to the, if you want, this is a bosonic part of the spectral action. Okay. And there is a fermionic part, which I began to explain a little bit last time. And the fermionic part is very simple to define because essentially the fermions are coming from the Hilbert space. Okay, that Hilbert space, when one works in four dimensions, it has a little bit extra structure. It has structure which comes from the Z2 grading, which is called the chirality operator, gamma. And it has an extra structure which comes from the real structure, which is, okay, which I explained in great detail last time. Now, these structures are important. They are important both in mathematics and in physics. I explained that. You know, in mathematics, the J is coming from the fact that the manifold is not characterized by its fundamental class in complex case theory, but in KO theory. Uh, in physics, the J is coming from what is called the charge conjugation operator. Now, the Z2 grading, okay, in mathematics, it's coming from the fact that we are talking about an even dimensional space, and in physics, it's called the chirality operator. So all of these things have a perfect meaning. And uh, the fermionic action uses a full structure, okay? So the fermionic action is based on the fact that if you look at the following form, J xi times D uh, xi prime, let us say, okay, this turns out, as we showed last time, when that when you work in KO dimension, which is equal to 2 modulo 8, it turns out that this quantity is an anti-symmetric bilinear form of xi, and then and thus you can take its Pfaffian, or if you want, you can write it as an additive term in the action, and the action, the functional integral, the fermionic functional integral will automatically take the Pfaffian. So what happens is the following, is that uh, um, uh, one needs to have dimension 2 modulo 8, and that comes from the, if you want, the computations, and the structure of the space F, and as I explained last time, Okay, this space F turns out to be of dimension 6 modulo 8 when one does the computations. And uh, that's why when you uh, uh, cross by uh, uh, space, I mean, ordinary uh, continuum, which has dimension 4, okay, you get 6 plus 4 modulo 8, which is 2. It could be actually that it's 4 minus 2. That means that the finite space is actually of dimension minus 2. Not six. Okay. I mean, we will have to experiment with that. For the time, we don't really know. Okay. Okay. There is another point which I want to make. I mean, uh, some people who are totally, I don't know. I mean, you know, stuck with the Minkowski signature uh, might worry that uh, all of what is done here is done in the Euclidean signature. Now, I mean, for that, one has to have a little knowledge of physics to appreciate how nice it is to go to Euclidean. And to appreciate that, you have to ask the question of what is the prescription in the functional integral when you write the Feynman integral. So when you write the Feynman integral where you write exponential of i of the action and you write you know, some function, some observable quantity of a times dA, well, then you will find out that this, you could put an h bar in the denominator here then you will find out that even for the free field, this functional integral is ill-defined. It's not ill-defined because you cannot integrate under Gaussian. It's not a problem. It's ill-defined because the propagator is ill-defined when you go to Minkowski space. And it's ill-defined because the propagator in Minkowski space is uh, 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 written as 1 over p square minus m square. Now, of course, this has a pole. It has a pole on the mass shell when p square is equal to m square. And uh, there is no way, whatever you try to do, that you can uniquely define 1 over p square minus m square when you Fourier transform back because of this singularity. There is a well-known trick, which is called the Feynman epsilon trick, which is to add to the p square minus m square a term which is i epsilon, okay, where epsilon is positive, and then to eliminate epsilon when epsilon goes to zero. This is called the Feynman trick. It works. It gives you the right result. 
But it takes uh, some mathematical work, which I did in my class this year, because just to explain, you know, to understand what it means conceptually. So if you work in Minkowski space, you don't see. You don't see. You have no reason why shouldn't you take minus i epsilon. Why do you take plus i epsilon? Okay. Now, uh, uh, so you can explain that it is because you want, you know, retard potentials and all that and so forth and so on and so forth. Okay. However, what happens, and this is the beauty of the Euclidean functional integral, is that when you Vic rotate to imaginary time, then the propagator becomes 1 over p squared plus m squared. Okay? So in that case, there is no ambiguity whatsoever in the definition of the propagator. And it is through the analytic continuation back to Minkowski space that you have chosen the plus i epsilon. In other words, the fact that you have chosen the plus i epsilon is just an indication that you had to big rotate to the uh, Euclidean functional integral. Well, a sense of difference is that p square in Minkowski is not positive. Yeah, sure, <coughs> sure. Okay, so you see what happens. Okay, sure, it's this essential difference, but I mean, uh, you have to go to be able to give a prescription how to go around the pole. And this is a choice. It's definitely a choice. Now, what I am saying is that this choice is given the, from the conceptual and automatic manner in the functional integral when you do the Euclidean functional integral. Okay? I'm not saying that you are only going to do physics by doing Euclidean things. Of course, at some point, much later, you will have to come back to what is three-dimensional observables and so on and so forth. And I hope that in my last lecture on Wednesday, in the last hour, I will give a kind of sketch of a possible theory, which I don't want to call a theory of quantum gravity, but which is very, uh, which we got with Martin Marcoli by analogy with uh, the work in number theory. And you will see that in that theory, you come back indeed to three dimensions. So, but for a long time, you know, you want to simplify things at the maximum. You don't want to complicate things from the start. And going to the Euclidean functional integral does simplify things tremendously. Precisely because it avoids all these type of ambiguities. Okay, so that's why if you want to simplify and to get started, okay, what one does is one takes a four-dimensional, even compact, Euclidean manifold, okay, with Euclidean signature crossed by F and one proceeds. Okay, so what I want to explain today is that the model is actually doing pre predictions, namely what we shall get, we shall get the standard model coupled with gravity, but we shall get less parameters than there are in the standard model coupled with gravity. In fact, we shall get three less parameters, and hence we shall make three predictions. And each of these predictions can actually be invalidated by physics. Okay? So, I mean, uh, uh, what, what is the situation? It's a little bit like this. I mean, uh, if the predictions are invalidated, it's a bad sign. Okay? On the other hand, it doesn't say that the theory is necessarily absolutely wrong because for a long time, for about 10 years, there, there was a bad sign for the theory and the bad sign for the theory was that it didn't have neutrino mixing. Okay? And of course, you know, this was a bad sign in the sense that it was an experimental fact which was not coming from the theory. But now, fortunately, what we found is that with a lot of work, actually, the mathematics was spitting out the neutrino mixing. Okay? So, I mean, the situation, if there is new physics which is discovered, the situation will really be the following. Will that formalism adapt to the new data which are given by the new physics? Okay? And we shall see when we are talking about the predictions that among the predictions there is a unification of the coupling constants. Now, it's known that this prediction doesn't exactly hold. We'll see a graphics very soon. Okay? So, the fact that this prediction doesn't exactly hold is telling that Okay, at some point, if you want, when you sort of look finer and finer, there will be some new physics which appear. Okay? But, I mean, it won't be drastically different from what we have already. So, I mean, there will be a small adjustment. This is the idea. Okay, so the first point which I want to explain now, with respect to last time, is one point which has to do with Kaliza Klein, and which is different here, and which I believe is quite important. So, you see, uh, if you consider the type of theories which are called KK theory, not uh, Kasparov theory, <laughs> Kaluza Klein theory, okay. I mean, k physicists have a different KK than that tradition, okay? <laughs> so, if you look at these theories which are called uh, KK, okay, Kaluza Klein, 
uh, uh, they are uh, of the following kind. So the idea, it's a very old idea, okay, is that uh, you have in fact a space-time manifold which is bigger, uh, you know, than the ordinary, which is some kind of bundle, over the ordinary space-time manifold. Now, as I explained last time, you know, when you do that, the problem is the following: is that it would be okay to say that you have pure gravity on P. The trouble is that if you had pure gravity on P, then the group of invariants should be the group of diffeomorphisms of P. And when you do physics, this is not the group that you are actually handling. You are handling the group of automorphisms of the fiber bundle. So in other words, you are only taking those diffeomorphisms of P that actually preserve the fiber. And in fact, which are gauge transformations along the fibers. And this is extremely restrictive. And of course, this is not robust. You know, in other words, I mean, you could have a theory in which you say that you have very, very tiny little fibers and so on, but under diffeomorphisms, there is no reason that they become large. So, I mean, it creates a big problem in the theory. And at first sight, you might imagine that we are going to have the same problem here. Because, you know, here, when we are in this situation where we have M cross F, actually, you know, you could say that the space F is sort of disconnected because you have an algebra which is like complex numbers plus quaternions plus three by three matrices. So it has like three different pieces. And you could say at first, why don't you have something which is a certain diffeomorphism on one piece, another diffeomorphism on the other piece, and a third one on the third piece? I mean, after all, you know, this should be perfectly acceptable. Okay? <laughs> and actually, this is not what happens. And the reason why it's not what happens is because of the J, of the real structure. And it's because, if you want, in a sense, the theory we are talking about is a kind of unification but it's a unification where it's not a unitary group in Hilbert space, which is being considered. But when we consider the Hilbert space, okay, we only consider those unitaries which commute, okay, which which commute with with the structure that we have, namely with the operator J, which is the real structure, and the operator gamma, which is the gradient. Okay, and as I explained last time, the fact that U commutes with J uh, tells you that you are in the symplectic group. Because uh, in the dimension 2 modulo 8, we have j squared is equal to minus 1. Moreover, j is anti-linear, so ji is equal to minus ij. So in fact, we have quaternions. Okay? And the operator u is in fact commuting with quaternions, so it's really the symplectic group. Okay. So there is a notion which will make it totally obvious that if we take an automorphism of our situation here, it will induce a diffeomorphism of the base m, and a single diffeomorphism of the base and this notion is the following. This notion is that if the, if, when you have a non-commutative geometry, there is in fact associated to it a commutative one, which is a kind of real part of the non-commutative geometry, and which is defined like this. So it's defined by taking those elements in the algebra, A, which commute with the real structure. Okay? So, I mean, you can see that because they commute with the real structure, they form a subalgebra. I mean, this is pretty obvious. Okay? It's a real algebra. It's not a complex algebra because remember that J is anti-linear. Okay. By the way, this J has to do, of course, with Tomita's J. I mean, uh, it's not of square one. It's of square plus or minus one, but it has to do with that. Okay, so this equality defines, in fact, an involutive commutative real subalgebra. And in fact, it belongs to the center of A. Why does it belong to the center of A? Because if you remember, there was a very important property which is related to Tomita's theory. And this property was the computation relation that A, J, B star, J inverse had to vanish for any element A and B in the algebra A. So, you know, I explained last time that this property is a replacement for commutativity. But for people who know Tomita's theory, this is exactly the basic condition. You know, the fact that you move to the commutant of the algebra by conjugating by J. So they, there is this sort of anti-isomorphism with the commutant Rather here, you just move to the commutant, okay, by this property. So what happens, of course, is that if X commutes with J, then, you know, uh, uh, you will have that J X J inverse, okay, is equal to X. So it will commute with every other element of the algebra, okay. So it belongs, in fact, to the center of the algebra. And moreover, you can restrict the structure. Namely, the Hilbert space is still with the representation of this subalgebra, and you still have a Dirac type operator. So, in fact, it's a real spectral triple. And, uh, okay, so, in fact, uh, one can say much more. One can say that because of the order one property, it actually commutes with all these sums. Okay, I mean, that's a simple, very simple fact. 
Okay, so wh what is the use for that? Well, the use for that is the following is that, you know, so this, yeah. this is a functorial definition. If you have a non-commutative geometry, you have its real part. So, in particular, one can look at the real part of the finite geometries that we had defined last time. And what you find out, it's a very simple exercise, is that the real part of the finite geometry, of the finite non-commutative geometries that we had explained last time, is just the center. It's just the real line. It's extremely simple. So this algebra, you know, is simple. I don't know if I said that last time, if I explained it last time. It's a central algebra. It doesn't look like that, you know, because the algebra has several components. But when you look at its representation, the representation is so tight that, you know, the, the central part is only the scalars. This is extremely important. So, I mean, from that, you deduce trivially that when you take the product by the smooth manifold, the real part of the algebra of functions from M to this finite dimensional algebra for the product geometry is, in fact, just smooth functions on the manifold with real values. Okay. And because this construction is entirely functorial, now you know where you are. You know that we don't have this problem that Kaliza Klein people have. You see, the problem of Kaliza Klein people is the following, is that if I give you an automorphism of the top manifold P, Okay. Mm. Be too optimistic. Okay. Uh, well, it's okay. So you see, if I give you an automorphism of P, okay, a diffeomorphism of P, in general, of course, this diffeomorphism is not going to preserve the vibration. Fairly obvious. And then you are in trouble. Whereas in our case, what we can say almost from the start is that if we take uh, an automorphism of our situation, well, it's going, of course, to induce an automorphism of the real part of the geometry. Because the real part of the geometry is given by smooth functions on M with values in R, okay, we deduce immediately from elementary considerations that we do have a different morphism of M. Okay, so that's the statement. So the statement is put in, in words like this. Okay, so if you take the real spectral triple, which is associated to the product geometry, product of M by the finite geometry, and you take a unitary operator in Hilbert space, okay, which has the right properties, namely it commutes with the grading, commutes with J, and it is such that it globally preserves the algebra. You are not asking, of course, that you know, it commutes with the algebra. You are just asking that it globally preserves the algebra. Then there exists a unique diffeomorphism of the manifold M such that when you look at the elements in the real part of the algebra, which are those commuting with J, then the action of this U is given by composition was fire. Okay? So this is telling us that, in fact, we are better off than in Kaliza Klein. We have something which does act on the base, naturally. Okay? We don't have several different morphisms. And there is a finer theorem, which I don't want to enter into, which is giving you what is the nature of this group, which I call the special unitary group of the finite algebra. You see, when you take the unitary group of the finite algebra, the special unitary group, there was the adjoint action we saw last time, and the adjoint action was just given by u uh, of uh, add, add u, Okay, on the vector xi was u xi u star. Using what? Using the bimodule structure which is coming from the tomita operator. And so written in, in uh, more ordinary terms, this would give u j u j inverse times xi. And notice that I don't put a star here because in the isomorphism, the anti-isomorphism with the dual, there is a star already. Okay? So this is a joint action. So the point is the following now is that uh, uh, I have been repeating many, many times, but there is a subtle point there, that the reason for non-commutative geometry was that the gauge transformations were the inner automorphisms, and that you know the gravitational part was the outer automorphisms. Now, this is a precise, very precise statement. So the very precise statement is given by this theorem. Okay? So the theorem is telling you that when you take an automorphism of our situation, all right, it will automatically induce a different morphisms of the manifold, that's for the gravitational part, but it will also comprise a part which is inner, okay, which is this adieu part here, and which will comprise the gauge transformation part. Okay? And that describes completely the automorphisms of the situation. So the automorphisms of the situation are composite of one part which is purely gravitational and one part which is purely gauge. All right? And it's written in this theorem. 
And now, once you are in the commutant, of course, if you are in the commutant of everything, there is nothing. I mean, it's a pure isomorphism of the representation, so there is no, nothing is changed. Okay? So that's the statement. I mean, this statement is a little bit subtle, you know, because naively, what you would think, you would, you would get it wrong. If you would do it just naively, you would just get it wrong. I mean, if you don't use the representation in Hilbert space, you don't get the right answer. But of course, I mean, you know, the automorphisms, so they have to be implemented in Hilbert space. So this is a situation. This is a situation. And okay, so I mean, that's a good sign. It already says, if you want, that uh, we have, uh, uh, as far as the symmetries are going, we are in, in good shape. But now what we want to, to do, we really want to get the gauge bosons of the standard model. Okay, and so the, how do the gauge bosons arise? I told last time, they arise from Morita equivalence. So the gauge bosons, I explained that last time, I don't want to do it again. They arise from uh, Morita equivalence. And Morita equivalence creates fluctuations of the non-commutative metric. And it replaces by, if you want, the, it adds to the original Dirac operator. It adds uh, gauge bosons. But it adds them in a certain combination, okay, because the, the real structure has to be preserved. So, I mean, the inner fluctuations are of the following form. You replace D by, sorry, D plus A, but that's not all, plus J, A, J inverse. I mean, this formula would not always be valid. There would be a plus or minus sign here. But when you work in even dimensions, it's always this formula. So these are the inner fluctuations of the metric. And uh, they come completely canonically, com completely conceptually from something which has no meaning in the commutative case, which is a Morita equivalence. Okay. So when you look at, if you want, non-commutative geometry in that sense, you find out that there is something new with respect to the commutative world, which is precisely these inner fluctuations. Exactly as there is something new with respect to automorphisms, which are the inner automorphisms. Okay, the inner automorphisms are not a big deal. The inner fluctuations are no big deal either. But when you are in a given situation, you have to compute them. How do you compute them? To compute them, you have to compute a bimodule and this bimodule is a bimodule of, I wouldn't call it one forms. I mean, you know, th there is a temptation, which is to call these things one forms. It's not a very good thing, because one forms, I mean, we sort of more or less know what they are. It is the Hoch shield um, one-dimensional homology group with coefficients in A. I mean, that's a natural definition of one forms, which doesn't use any, any structure, okay? Now, here, they are not one forms, they are gauge potentials, I would say. And, uh, I mean, it's a bimodule. The gauge potentials are actually a little bit more precise. They are elements of this form, omega, but, or capital A, if you want, but they have to satisfy one condition, which is that A is equal to A star. So they have to be self-adjoint. Okay, and in any given situation, you have to determine the uh, gauge potentials because they are inherent part of the structure. Now, in our situation, we have to do that. It's not so simple. It's not so simple because the operator D has two pieces. It has one piece, which is the ordinary Dirac operator on the manifold. I mean, this is not something, it's not a very complicated <coughs> object. It's, a comp uh, it's an object which you can write in terms of a Virbein locally by ex completely explicit formulas. It's an order one operator. It's not very difficult. And then we have gamma five tensor DF. I mean, this gamma five is coming from the fact we are taking the product of the two geometries. We have the general formula for that. And what is this DF? This DF is this finite matrix, which is describing the Dirac operator for the finite space. Last time, what we did was to classify all of these Dirac operators. So we know what they are. And you see that when you write a, a gauge potential like this, I mean, sigma of AI, DAI prime, it will decompose because it's linear in this, this expression. So it will have a component which is coming from the commutator with dm times 1. And it will have a component which is coming from the commutator with gamma 5 times df. Okay? So gamma 5 commutes with elements. So, I mean, gamma 5 is irrelevant. The relevant part will be coming from the commutation of these things with df. So what happens, and uh, uh, by analogy, if you want, with what happens with complex manifolds, one writes the two components. This component, we write it as component of type 1, 0. And the component, which is the discrete part, we write it as a component of type 0, 1. 
Okay, I mean, this is just a notation. So what we have to do, we have to compute these things. And it is a computation. I mean, it, you know, it's really a computation. It's not something that you you put as an axiom or anything like that. It is a computation. Okay. Now, that computation splits into two pieces, and I'm going to explain very briefly how you go and compute. But as I said, you know, it's a computation. It's not something which is... Okay, so what do you do? Uh, uh, I have not kept the, the... In fact, I couldn't fit it on one transparency. You know, the formula for the Dirac operator is quite uh, uh, large. And remember that in the Dirac operator, we also had a piece which was relating the particle sector to the entire particle sector. However, that piece was commuting exactly with the algebra, so it doesn't contribute to the gauge potentials. So what you do, you do the computation of the A01 part. And uh, what do you find? You find that, uh, you know, so the elements, they are uh, uh, functions with values in the sum of complex numbers plus quaternions plus 3 by 3 matrices. Similarly for the A prime I. So you compute this stuff, okay? And you find, remember that there was a part of the space which was tensored by a three-dimensional space, which I denote by A3, and by a one-dimensional space, which I don't by A1 in the representation. So it will have two pieces. You compute. And uh, I mean, the piece which corresponds to A1 will be very similar to that one, except that there will be no tensor 1, 3 here. Okay? So you compute it, and what do you find? You find that in terms of the Dirac operator, which I had given last time, it had these matrices, Y, with an up and down, and it had a 3, and it had also had a 1 for the other one. Okay? So you find a very completely explicit expression but where phi 1 and uh, uh, phi prime 1 and phi 2 are a little bit complicated, they are given by explicit formulas. And these explicit formulas are the following. So, of course, they are computed from the AI and the A prime I. And so they are computed, if you want, from the lambda I, the alpha I, and so on, and the MI. Okay? Now, it turns out the MI don't enter. The only thing which enters are the lambda I, alpha I, and beta I. Okay? What are alpha and beta? You know, a quaternion, Q, is written as a 2 by 2 matrix. Q is equal to alpha, alpha bar, beta, and minus beta bar. Okay? So if you want, when we write the AI, when you write the QI here, QI spits out an alpha I and a beta I. And similarly, Q prime I spits out an alpha prime I and a beta prime I. Okay? So what you can do, you can take this huge matrix, you can put it in the computer, <laughs> Okay, just to be sure not to make a mistake. I mean, it's bad. Okay, of course you first do it by hand. Okay, and, and and then you look at the result, and the result tells you that in fact there are two fields. There are actually four fields which come out. There is a field phi one, phi one which is sigma of lambda i alpha prime i minus lambda prime i. These are functions. Everything are, are functions. There is a field phi two which is sigma of lambda i beta prime i. There is a field phi prime 1, which is given by this formula, and a field phi prime 2, which is given by this formula. Okay. Now, it takes a little bit of doing to show that you get four independent complex-valued fields, that they are really independent. Okay. You see, we have data which are, which are indeed independent. I mean, the lambda i are independent of the alpha i and so on. But you have to do a little bit of work to show that you get actually completely arbitrary functions, phi 1, phi 2, phi prime 1, phi prime 2. Okay. If you want uh, an abstract proof for that, I mean, you can easily show that the set of obtained functions is a C infinity of n module. Okay? Why? Because uh, in all these formulas, you can multiply the lambda i or the alpha i and everything by a scalar valued function. And because they are C infinity of n module, to show that they generate independent fields, it's enough to show that in each fiber they generate what you have. Okay? So then what you have to do is you have to show that at a given point, you really get a four-dimensional complex space. Okay? And this you can do by taking specific values of the alpha i, lambda i, and then you get the function which is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on. Okay? So that's relatively simple. Okay, so one can show that. Now, once you have shown that, you are not yet done because actually you want this to be self-adjoint. So because you see, when I told you that I had four independent fields, which were phi 1, phi 2, phi prime 1, and phi prime 2, it would seem that you have four complex-valued scalar fields, which would be too much, because we have only 
a pair of complex valued scalar fields you know, in the standard model. And the reason is quite simple. The reason is that what you want, you want A301 to be self-adjoint, so you want X prime to be the adjoint of X. Now you see very well that X only depends on phi 1, phi 2. So of course, you know, there will be a relation between the phi prime and the phi's, and that will tell you that there is exactly a pair of scalar fields. Now, when you do the computation for the thing with the, with the index 1 instead of 3, you get the same formula. Okay? So, in fact, out of that, you get the following result. You get as a corollary the following uh, statement. So, the statement is the following, is that when you look at the discrete part of the uh, 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 form, I mean, of the gauge potential, so the discrete part A01 of the inner fluctuations of the metric is, in fact, parametrized by a single quaternionic valued function. And that quaternionic vo valued function is phi 1 plus phi 2j. <coughs> okay? So if you want it, phi prime 1 and phi prime, prime 2 are totally uh, uh, forced, dictated, and they are related to phi 1 and phi 2 by the self adjointness condition. Okay, so not only that, but there is also a nice statement which is that, you know, uh, when you look at the coupling, so when you look at these matrices here, which are the coupling matrices, in fact, you find out something. You find out that there is an analogy, if you want, there is a, a similarity between the coupling of the up particle, namely the, the, the upper line here, and the low particle, namely the lower line here. So there is a similarity between the two, and it turns out that the similarity between the two has a very nice quaternionic and uh, interpretation at the level of quat quaternions it's just a multiplication by the quaternion j okay you know the quaternion j i mean it is it is the same as this capital j i was talking about it anti commutes with i and uh, i mean this this is a well known uh, refinement of the Weinberg, of the glacial weinberg salam model from leptons to quarks when you pass from the theory of leptons which was first devised to the theory of quarks you find out that uh, because, you know, in the old-fashioned standard model, the leptons were ma the neutrinos were massless, there was no point to have a Yukawa coupling for the uh, low, for the down particles for the leptons. And when people tried to do it for quarks, they had to have the coupling, the Yukawa coupling, for the uh, um, uh, uh, down quark, the strange quark, and the, and the, the bottom quark. And actually, I mean, to obtain it, they found a very nice trick, physics trick, which was to replace the complex X doublet by another complex X doublet, mm -hmm. which had the same uh, weak isospin, but which had the opposite hypercharge. And that's exactly this operation. So it has a very, very nice sort of mathematical, or if you want, quaternionic interpretation. And I mean, this is also known to physicists, actually. I mean, when, when they think in quaternionic terms, I mean, it's a known fact. OK, so that's what we have for the uh, zero one part of the uh, uh, inner fluctuation. So this means that the uh, zero one part of the inner fluctuation is in fact parametrized by a quaternionic valid function. It's very nice to think of it this way. Uh, the way, if you want, uh, uh, people, physicists used to think about is a pair of complex fields. So phi 1 and phi 2 are now both are complex fields, of course. You know. And, uh, of course, you know, this writing of a quaternion is the same as the writing which is here. I mean, when I write a quaternion as alpha and beta in that way, I am just writing as alpha plus beta j. Okay, it's the same thing. Okay. So, we know the uh, zero one part, and now, uh, the zero one part, and now we have to look at the one zero part of the inner fluctuation. So, the one zero part is sort of more not easy, but, you know, more standard in many ways. And it's given by the following. Okay, so, the, the, uh, so here we have the general thing. What we did so far, if you want, is to determine the commutators with that part, gamma 5 times dF. Now we have to determine the commutators with this part. Well, the commutators with this part are not that difficult, you know, because after all, uh, uh, we are committing with the Dirac operator. When you commute with the Dirac operator, of course, you get an operator of order zero, which is just Clifford multiplication by the differential. Okay? So you'll get ordinary gauge potentials. And these gauge potentials will be uh, uh, of a different gauge group according to whether we have C, the complex numbers, or we have quaternions, or we have three by three matrices. So it will not be very hard. 
it will not be very hard. And uh, when we do it, what do we find? We find the following. We find that the vector part of the inner fluctuation is given by a formula. And it's also a formula that only uses the lambda i, the alpha i. You know, when I write here qi d q prime i, this qi is made of alpha i and beta i. And similarly here. Okay. So what we get is a U1 gauge field, which I call capital lambda, which is given by this. We get an SU2 gauge field, which is this one. It's very nice because uh, if you look at the little booba at here on the young mills uh, and stanton and so on, you will find out that he did the right thing. He formulated everything in quaternionic terms. So in fact, you know, an SU2 gauge field, the best way to think of it is in quaternionic terms. Okay. The beauty, if you want, is that, the, of course, SU2 is a unit quaternions. But more than that, I mean, what, what happens is that when you look at the, um, the algebra and so on, it has a beautiful interpretation in these terms. And there is a U3 gauge field, which is this one. Okay? Now, uh, uh, one thing which is a little bit tricky, one thing which is a little bit tricky is to check, you know, you might be worried. You might be worried that the formulas we were using before for the phi, you know, Remember that phi was written in terms of the alphas by some formula. Yes. So remember that there was some formula here, which is here. Mm. Where is it? Yeah. Okay. So th there was this formula for for the phi. So you see, you might be worried that after all, the phi's depend on the lambdas and the alpha i and all that, okay? And the gauge potential also depend on the lambdas and the alpha and so on. So you might be worried that these are not independent things. So there is definitely a proposition to be proved, and we prove it very carefully in the paper, which is that you will indeed get completely independent fields. I mean, you will have this pair of quaternionic valued fields and these gauge potentials, and they will be totally independent. That means they will be completely arbitrary uh, 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 gauge potentials, okay? And in order to do that, again, the trick is the same. The trick is that you prove a priori that it's a synfinity of M module, and then you have to show that at each point it spans the right dimension, okay? So, I mean, it's a very useful fact, this fact that if you have a synfinity of M module, it's enough to know that it spans a fiber at a point to know that it's okay. Now, there is a further thing, which is that when you compute, okay, so when you compute, you find out that there are far more refined stuff, because you will find the hypercharges of the standard model. You need them badly. So when you compute, you find that uh, actually, yuch, this thing is very unstable. Yuch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you compute, you find that actually, when you look at the unimodular gauge, po gauge potentials, then those which are, which are trace zero, so it's extremely simple. You find that they are parameterized by a U1 gauge field, B, an SU2 gauge field, which corresponds to the quaternion valued stuff, and an SU3 valued field, uh, 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 V, okay? Moreover, when you compute a representation, I hope this will be visible, this is not clear, so. I mean, let me put it in the middle because it's the usual problem I have with transparencies, which is that I'm unable to put big formulas. This formula is not too big, but I don't think it is. I hope it's visible somehow. Okay, that's what you get. Let, let me comment on that. You know? So you get exactly what uh, one should have. Okay, and then you compute. It's a computation. And what you find out is that uh, uh, the, the operators that you have to add, not to the Dirac operator, but to the derivative. You see, so each partial derivative d mu now is replaced by what is called the covariant derivative. And this gives you the gauge potential in its coordinate mu. All right? Of course, this then is put in the Dirac operator formula. Okay? So with the gamma mu's and so on. But I mean, the recipe is the following. So, and what is a mu? There is an a mu for the, for the quarks, and there is an a mu for the leptons. All right? And they are given by formulas, and the formulas are these formulas. Okay? It's just a computation. Once, once again, this is a computation. 
But you can see in this computation appearing the hypercharges. We saw last time already how the hypercharges are computed. You see them appearing here. So you see here that there is, uh, let me see. Uh, yes, you see here that there is a one third hypercharge because it's G1 over 2, I G1 over 2, which is relevant. So there is a one third hypercharge, uh, uh, which is for these things. There is a, a, a minus one third here, and there is a four third here. Because, I mean, the, right, the potential is minus I G1 over 2 B mu. Okay? And this is how you see the <coughs> hypercharges of the quarks here. And you see the hypercharges of the leptons here. So you see, for instance, that the right hand in neutrino has zero hypercharge, that the uh, uh, electron has minus two, and, uh, and, and you have a minus one here for the, uh, um, for the left handed electron, for the hypercharge. I mean, left handed electron and neutrino. Okay, so this is the right table, turns out. And uh, so now we are all equipped because we have computed the inner fluctuations, okay? And so what do we know? Well, anticipating a little bit, if you want, what we know is the following. We know that our non-commutative metric has an inner part, and that this inner part is exactly the gauge bosons of the standard model, okay? Namely, they contain the X, which is a quaternionic valued field, They contain uh, the U1 gauge potential, which is B mu. They contain the SU2 gauge potential, which is W mu. And they contain the uh, 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 SU3 gauge potential, which is v, v mu. Now, uh, in the computation, which is done in detail in the paper, it's a very nice fact, if you want, that um, when you look at quaternions, the quaternions which, are, which don't have a, a component on the reals are skew adjoint. This is what tells you that you have a three-dimensional Lie algebra, and it is a Lie algebra of SU2. I mean, this is the way you get the W mu here. It's a very concrete, explicit calculation. I mean, you know, it does. But as I said, I mean, you know, it fits exactly with this framework that Atia was developing. Okay, so let me now come to the... I want to go to the prediction in the second part, so let me now come to the main theorem. So it's a mathematical theorem, and it is the following. So the main theorem is the following. Main theorem is a spectral definition of the spectral model. So it says the following. It says that if you take a Riemannian spin four manifold and F our finite non-commutative geometry, which has dimension six, okay? and if we consider the product space endowed with a product metric. So what does it mean in non-commutative framework to take the product metric? It means to add the corresponding Dirac operators. Okay. So, first statement is that the unimodular subgroup of the unitary group acting by the adjoint representation is exactly the group of gauge transformation of the standard model. Okay. And this we essentially saw last time. Because we saw last time that the adjoint action for the unitary group of the finite dimensional algebra was going, giving exactly the right hypercharges and the right group, which is U1 cross SU2 cross SU3. Remember that we had this up to a finite group, which has a group of roots of unity, of order 12, and of order three, okay? But that's fine, because we are working at the level of the Lie algebra, so it's perfectly fine. So the second thing is that the unimodular inner fluctuations of the metric gives the gauge boson the standard model. This is what I just showed, okay? I mean, I gave you a sketch. Of course, if you want to check it, you know, it will take forever, and this is done in the paper, right? Now, the crucial statement, the key statement, is that, in fact, the full standard model with neutrino mixing and the CISO mechanism, okay? Minimally coupled to Einstein gravity. So what does it mean? It means that, in fact, it's not only the standard model in flat space that we are going to obtain, but we are going to obtain the standard model in curved space, okay? Minimally coupled, that means that it has all the gravitational ingredients, and that when we write the variational equation, we obtain exactly the Einstein equation in curved space, where the source for the matter is coming from the standard model. So it's the right source, okay? So it's exactly what you want. So it's given in Euclidean form by the following action. I don't think one can make simpler, okay? So I mean, this is going to spit out the full thing, okay? That's the, okay, it's a big statement, all right? And what is this action? Well, you know, it is the spectral stuff which you apply to the inner fluctuation of D 
divided by lambda. Okay. And to that, you add the following. So you add this bilinear skew-symmetric form, but you treat it as a Pfaffian. Namely, you treat it with anti-commuting variables, which I call psi tilde. So when you treat it with anti-commuting variables, it no longer vanishes when you take the same element on both sides. Okay, because this thing is anti-commute now. If you want this element of wedge 2 of the space. Okay. And then you can take its Pfaffian. How do you take the Pfaffian? Well, by writing the functional integral with family variables, I mean with Grassmann variables. This spits out the Pfaffian. Okay, so the statement is that this will give you exactly the full standard model with neutrino mixing and so on. And, you know, I, I, I had a, my, my bet was that in every lecture I would do in this class, I will show you standard model. And gradually, you will get more familiar with it. Okay, this is the idea. If you want. <laughs> okay, so once again, I'm going to show it to you. <laughs> okay, and I hope, I mean, you know, you, but I mean, you can forget about it. Somehow the statement of the theorem is forget it completely, okay? Why? Because now it's subsumed by this recipe. And in fact, it's much better because, in fact, it gives you not only the standard model, but the standard model coupled, minimally coupled with gravity. Okay, so this is how the guy is looking, like, right? oh my god. Standard model which has some stuff on it, okay. okay. So it's a very beautiful thing, as you can see. I mean, it's full of W's and Z's, <laughs> <laughs> with plus and minuses. <laughs> okay, so that's the first page. <laughs> to get used to it, you know. <laughs> okay, that's the second page. Maybe I will spare, I will spare you the fourth page, you know, because <laughs> this is the second page. <laughs> that's the third page. Third page. And there is a fourth page. But the fourth page is all about ghosts. You know. So ghosts can be kept in the closet somehow. Okay? I mean, and, and they are derived from the rest. I mean, if you want the ghost, the construction of the ghost is a completely sort of canonical construction once you fix a gate. So it's perfectly okay. So what is this guy? I mean, this guy is, you know, it's really a monster. And it's a monster either in that place, you know, mainly because of this sine square W, this Kobayashi uh, mixing matrix, uh, I mean, okay. And it's a monster also, mainly also because of that, because now you have this CW square in the denominator, you know. So, I mean, uh, what we do in the paper, we sort of, as carefully as we can, identify term by term the computation from the spectral action with all these terms here, okay, term by term. I mean, you know, if you look at it very carefully, you'll find out that, well, it has been arranged. These are just the gauge couplings. So, I mean, this is young mills, except that it's young mills where you have to remember that uh, uh, the photon is massless and uh, the W uh, and W plus and minus and the Z0 form the components of the SU2 gauge field. And the G mu A's are the gluons, and they form the components of the SU3 gauge field. And uh, moreover, the symmetry breaking mechanism from the X endows the W with a mass and the Z with a mass. So the mass term for the W is here, the mass term for the Z is here, and the ratio between the mass of the Z and the mass of the W is 1 over uh, the cosine, cosine of the Weinberg angle, so that the mass square there is a cosine square. There is a factor of one half because the z is just a scalar field, whereas I mean real scalar field, whereas the w is a complex field. That's why you don't have a one half in terms of the w here, okay? Because it's a complex field. So if you want it as two real components which cancel the one half, and there are plenty of details. I mean there are details everywhere. Okay, so this is if you want the uh, kinetic energy of the of the complex X field, which will become a ghost after the gauge fixing. This is uh, the um, uh, tadpole term. This is a sort of cosmological constant term. 
This is the mass term which is for the ghost part of the X field, which is a transformation which is due to a spe specific choice of a gauge from the uh, uh, um, um, how is it called? Um, um, when you break the symmetry, you have Goldson bosons. So the X components phi zero and phi plus minus are a priori are Goldson bosons, but there is a gauge fixing that makes them massive, okay, so which is which is embodied here. And then here you have the cubic coupling for the X field. Here you have the quartic coupling for the X field, which is huge. Okay, it's a huge expression here. Here you have the minimal coupling between the X field and the W boson with the Z boson. You have the, uh, um, um, this is a minimal coupling of the X field with the W again, but I mean, you know, you have a, a derivative term for the X field. Here you have a similar thing for with the uh, W plus, W minus, with a d mu of H, not d mu of phi minus. Here you have with d mu of phi zero. Here you have a minimal coupling between Z0, W plus, and you see you have a very strange thing, which is very scary. It's the square of the sine of W divided by the cosine of W. And here you have something even more scary. 1 minus 2 is the square of the cosine of... How are you going to obtain all these terms? You know? <laughs> what has to obtain all these terms on the nose? Okay. So this is what happens, and we, we have done this check as carefully as we could. Okay. But what happens is more than that, in the sense that when you write down the dictionary, if you are over careful, you find out that there are predictions. Namely, you will find out that you get less freedom than in the standard model. So I mean, to, to recapitulate the standard model, there is a dictionary of terms which enter in the formulas. So if you want, there is notations. So notations are like this. I mean, you know, the A, W, Z, and G. G is for the gluons. So these are, these are the gauge bosons, the quarks. They were collectively denoted by Q in the formula which was here. So the start formula. Uh, let me see. No, they, it must be here, actually. It's probably here. It's in the, it's in the coupling with quarks. Yes. Uh, let me see. Yeah. You see, in this formula, you have the quarks. It's a collective name for the quarks, this QR. But when you look at them individually, they are not denoted globally. And for instance, this is a notation for the down quark. This is a notation for the up quark. And the lambda here is a family uh, index. Okay, so in other words, according to whether you are talking about the up, the uh, charm, or the top, you put a one or a two or three, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you have all these terms. So the notations are like this. The leptons are very easy. I mean, this is the neutrinos with the generations and the electrons with generations. The X has four components. There is only one which is physical, and the other ones become ghosts. The ghost, I didn't show you the ghost. Okay, I mean, it's another page, but I mean, as I said, it's canonically derived from the rest, so you don't need to see it. Okay, these are the masses. We saw last time that there was this beautiful uh, correspondence between the classification of the Dirac operator and the mass matrix. Okay, and we saw that there were moduli spaces. So the number of parameters that we get for that is the same. The coupling constant, you have the coupling constant G, which is square root of 4 pi alpha, and alpha is a fine structure constant. We have the strong coupling, and we have the, the um, alpha H. This is called the X scattering parameter, and it determines the X mass. It is the coefficient of the X quartic coupling, which is here. This, see. So here you have the X quartic coupling, and there is this coefficient alpha H. Then there is a tadpole constant, where we, are, we had the tadpole term. It has disappeared, but there was a tadpole term with beta H. There is a cosine and sine of the weak mixing angle, so this is CW, SW. And there is this Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa mixing matrix, which is C lambda Kaba. Now, in the model that we obtain, we all also have a mixing matrix for the, le for the leptons. And we have the uh, 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 CISO mechanisms for the neutrinos. They come out automatically. This complicates the Lagrangian and the standard model. But if you read books very carefully, you find out that the Lagrangian that we get is the preferred candidate for an extension of the standard model. I mean, it's really that one and nothing else. Okay, so that's notation. And uh, now, if you want, I will show you a table that before we go into the proof, well, not the proof, but I mean the, the, some details, I will show you a table which is really fundamental. 
And this table is a table of translation from the spectral model to the standard model. So if you want, on the one hand, you have the standard model, and it has incredibly deep roots in physics. On the other hand, we have the spectral model, and we have a, a table. I wish I could, you know, make it bigger. But <laughs> okay, so we have this uh, table. Now, uh, this table, uh, when we shall see shortly, you know, allows you to translate from notations in the standard model. You see very clearly that here there is a physical X, there is a neutral X component, there is a pair of complex components. Uh, you, we have the gauge boson of the standard model that we saw. We have the Fermion masses. We have the Kobayashi mixing. We have the lepton mixing when you put neutrino mixing. We have the Majorana mass matrix when you put uh, uh, CISO mechanism. You have the gauge couplings, which we saw before. Okay, and uh, traditionally, I mean, the Fermi coupling constant is called G2, and the um, electromagnetic coupling constant is called G1. And what it is is a product of G, or G2 if you want, by tangent that of the, of the Van der Rangel. Van der there is the X scattering parameter, there is the X mass, which is, there is a tadpole constant, and there is a graviton also, of course, one shouldn't forget the graviton. <coughs> so now what we shall see, we shall see from the computation of the spectral action that there is a perfect translation from this table, which is in physics, really. You know, all these things have deep, deep roots in physics, to a completely geometric translation, in which all of the terms will acquire a geometric meaning. So typically what will happen is that the inner part of the matrix will give you the x, the inner part 0, 1, which is the inner part of the fluctuation, gives you the x. The inner part 1, 0 gives you the gauge bosons. The component of the Dirac, which is in the up part, will give you this mass matrix for the top particles, either the neutrinos or the up particle for the quarks. The Dirac 0, 1, will give you the Kobayashi matrix, Kobayashi Maskawa mixing matrix, and the mass matrix. The Dirac 0, 1 in the uh, uh, bottom part uh, 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 for the leptons will give you the leptonic mixing matrix and the mass matrix for the uh, uh, um, uh, Yukawa, uh, um, sorry, for the neutrino, actually, and for the electron. And uh, the Majorana matrix, it will correspond to a certain piece of the Dirac operator, which we had, which we called YR. The gauge couplings, this is what we shall see very shortly now, uh, um, um, uh, we get a prediction. So we get uh, the prediction of the theory that the gauge coupling satisfies G3 square is equal to G2 square is equal to 5 thirds of G1 square. Okay. And uh, it turns out that this is exactly the same prediction as in what physicists call the grand unified theories. When I say grand unified theories, I don't say which one, because all the grand unified theories make the same prediction. Okay? If you look at SO10, if you look at SU5, they all make the same prediction. So it's the beauty of this theory that it does make the same prediction. Okay? It predicts, if you want, that there is a unification of the coupling constant. So it's two relations, actually. I mean, you know. It's two relations. It's telling you that the coupling constants are the same, modulo this coefficient of five thirds. Yeah. Okay. And we shall analyze this prediction in the next uh, hour. Uh, there is another prediction about the X scattering parameter and so on. But I think it's better if I interrupt now for about five, ten minutes and we come back. Okay, so I hope this will be a little bit more fun. Or maybe yeah, it's it's on. Okay, because, I mean, uh, now we shall, I, I will show you, you know, some graphs and so on, and uh, predictions and all that, okay. All right, so, I mean, when we compute, you know, the um, spectral action, okay, what do we find? Okay, let me put this table over there. Okay, so what do we find? I mean, we find, of course, you know, that there is on top of things, there is this gravitational piece. So when we look at the bosonic part, okay, of the spectral action, we find this formula. Okay, and we, we, we shall see that in this formula, okay, there is a lot of stuff which is not just the standard model, but there is a coupling with gravity, okay? So what do we see? First of all, we see a cosmological term, cosmological constant. 
So this cosmological constant turns out to have a coefficient, you know, uh, what are f4, f2, and f0? They are the moments of the test function. When we write trace of f of d square over lambda square, okay, there is a test function. You know, I think I wrote it somewhere here. The relation is, it's here. Yeah, so it's trace of f of d over lambda. Okay, and that function, so f of zero, we call f zero. Uh, f and in general f k is integral from zero to infinity of f of u u to the power k minus one g u. Okay, so that's what we have. And uh, as it turns out, when you compute, you find out that only three moments of the function are coming up, namely f zero, f two, and f four. Okay. Um, and uh, so they come up like this. I mean, F0 comes up in all the terms which are conformal. Uh, F2 comes in the gravitational terms, like the cosmological term and the Einstein term, yeah. And uh, um, F4 comes only for the cosmological term. In this term yeah. Okay, so now, uh, uh, so what are the terms here? So here you can see the Einstein-Hilbert action because you can see the integral of the scalar curvature. It has a coefficient, and this coefficient has the square of the cutoff. Okay, we shall see that because of the prediction, we shall take the cutoff to be of the order of the unification energy, and this will give us a prediction for the for the Newton constant. And what we shall see is that we get quite reasonable prediction, uh, provided we have that the ratio of f2 and f0 is of the order of five. Then we get the right Newton constant. But you know, the Newton constant is quite <laughs> uh, 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 incredibly a small coupling constant. So, I mean, it's a very nice fact. Then we get this term here, which is a, a topological term, which is an Euler characteristic, essentially. Okay. Uh, then we get this term here, which is purely gravitational. And uh, it is a term which is called the vile curvature term. So in other words, when you look at the four-dimensional manifold, there is a piece of the curvature tensor which is conformally invariant. I mean, which is becomes conformally invariant if you want when you then integrate with square root of g before x. Okay. So this is uh, uh, at the origin of what uh, Hermann Weyl called the conformal gravity, uh, and we shall see uh, what uh, type of predictions, what type of addition it does to the gravity. Okay. So we get this term here. Yeah. Uh, then, okay, we get a term which is, if you want, a quadratic term for the x, which is here, which is a kind, if you want, of a bare mass term for the x, okay, which is this term here. Then we get this term, which is uh, 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 extremely important because it will be responsible for all of these, essentially, essentially all of these, yes. and this is a minimal coupling. So in other words, it's a covariant derivative of the x field, but it's a covariant derivative of the x field which is using the w and the b field, okay, in a certain way. And when you expand this covariant derivative square, you will find terms of this type where there is a w field, the x field, the derivative of the phi minus, and so on. I mean, it is this term which is totally innocent looking that generates essentially this page, okay. Then you have the, the um, uh, Young Mills interaction, which was essentially the first page of the Lagrangian standard model. You have the Young Mills interaction for the three gauge fields, but you have this beautiful five third which is spit out from the computation. So the five third comes out of the computation. And uh, finally, there is a quartic self coupling of the X, which you can witness here. Okay which comes out, and it comes out with a certain specific coefficient, which is this f0 over 2 pi square, which is the same coefficient as for the gauge coupling, and the same coefficient as for the kinetic term here. So it's quite important. It will give us another prediction. Okay, so we shall see now, okay, more carefully, how to identify things. And if you really want to identify this action with a standard model, you have to do a chain of variables. The chain of variables is partly explained in the table, but uh, to be more concrete, I mean, what you do, you begin by doing a rescaling of the quaternionic valued field. 
so that the kinetic term for the X field is normalized. And uh, this uh, normalization forces you to replace uh, uh, the field phi by the field capital H, which is square root of AF0 over pi. The reason for that is extremely simple. You see that you have F0A over 2 pi square here, and you would like to have just d mu of H square. So what you have to do is you have to take square root of F0 times A and pi, and you'll be remaining with just with one half, which is what you want. And the second thing is you want to have the same thing for the kinetic terms of the gauge fields. And to have, you have to be very careful because naively you would say there is a one half in the Young Mills action. No, it's a one fourth. It's a one fourth because um, when you take the gauge, which is called the Feynman gauge, you find out that if you put a one fourth in terms of the f mu nu, f mu nu, you will find a one half term for the kinetic term. Okay, so it's a one fourth. So what you get as normalization is that g3 square f0 over 2 pi square, which is exactly the coefficient with an enters here, g3 square f0 over 2 pi square, should be equal to one fourth. Uh, g2 square same, but then there is a five third g1 square because you have a five third here. Okay. So this is the uh, normalization, just normalization. Of course, it ent entails a prediction, okay, between these things. And uh, uh, um, when you carry over this change of variables, what you find is that now the bosonic action sort of simplifies, or if you want, takes another form, which is a little bit simpler than the one which was written there. I mean, it's more compact, it's not simpler. It's more compact, and what does it look like? Well, it looks like this now. So it's more in the physicist language. So what you get is you get the Einstein-Hilbert action, which has a coupling constant, and the coupling constant is given by 1 over kappa 0 square. It's the same story as before. It's 1996 times F2 times lambda square minus F0C over 12 pi square. Okay, And this uh, was coming from the previous guy. Um, Now, it is the same thing as the previous one. Okay, the, in the previous guy, there was 24 pi square, but there is a one half, which is a tradition, you know, for the kinetic term. There, then there is a, a vile square term with a coefficient alpha zero. This coefficient alpha zero can be computed. It's minus 3 F zero over 10 pi square. There is a cosmological term, gamma zero, where gamma zero can be computed. It's given by this thing. There is a, uh, there is a Neuler term with coefficient tau zero. And there are the young mills term, which now have coefficient 1, 4. And there is a kinetic term for the Higgs. Okay? There is a mass term for the Higgs. There is a new term, which I didn't mention before, which was there before, which is a coupling between, between the scalar curvature and the square of the Higgs field. And that term, if you look, for instance, at Feynman knots on gravity, I mean, it's always there. When you, I mean, it's a term which is almost necessarily there, but you get a prediction for its coefficient. And there is finally this lambda zero term, which is the X quartic coupling term. Okay, so that's where we are. Now, we want to identify it with the standard model, with this change of variables. We use a table. We use a table. And uh, when you use a table, you know, you find out the following. You find out that uh, um, because of the uh, rescaling, which is done there, because of the rescaling which is done there, what you find is that our capital matrix is Y sub X. You know, there was Y for the leptons, for the quarks, and so on. They are not really used in full. They are only used projectively. Namely, they are used up to an overall scale. And the point is the following. The point is that the variable A, which is here, if you look, the variable A was defined as the sum well, it was the, let me write it in full. It is the trace, essentially, of the y for the electron square plus the y for the neutrino square plus 3. And, but this is a sum over the three families. Okay, So I will put a lambda here. Okay, So it's a sum over the lambda of this, of these things. And then there is a 3 of the down square, and there is a 3 for the up square. Now, this quantity actually turns out to have a, it has a name, the analogous quantity for standard model has a name. It's called Y2 of S. 
Now, if you look at this quantity, nevertheless, okay, it is clear that it is a quantity which is quadratic in the y's. So when you divide, you see, when you divide yx by square root of this quantity, any scale factor that you would have introduced in the y's disappears. So the y's only appear projectively. Okay, that's something to remember. The Dirac operator in the finite space only appears projectively. Now, uh, uh, what does it mean, however? It means that when you write the formula for changing variables, okay, I will write it uh, now. When you write the full formula for the changing variable from standard model to the spectral model, what do you find? I will put this transparency somewhere else because it's really so important. So let me put the table. Let me put the table in the middle. Okay, so what I am saying in the following is that when you write the, the translation from one model to the other, at first, in fact, you know, when we wrote the paper in uh, 96 with Ali Shamsedi, we didn't notice this point because we said, okay, you know, it all goes. After a point, you get convinced and you don't check every detail. Now, when you write down the translation, the translation is the following, that you pass from these matrices K, which are homogeneous because they cancel any scale that you have in the Y's, okay? You pass from this matrix K to the matrix of the standard model by the following transformation. I mean, this is when you identify the two formulas, the two huge formulas, you identify them term by term. What you have in the standard model are the coupling constant for the Fermi interaction divided by twice the mass of the W boson multiplied by the masses of the up quark, the down quark, the neutrinos, and the uh, electron. These are Yukawa masses, okay? Now, when you write these formulas, you find out, of course, the right-hand side is also of dimension zero because you divide a mass by a mass, okay? The left-hand side, similarly, and the left-hand side, you cannot rescale. You cannot rescale because it was uh, given by a homogeneous formula in terms of the y's. But now you get worried because you see this thing, because it has been rescaled by the A, does satisfy a constraint. What is the constraint? The constraint is that when you take the sum of the squares of this kx in the same combination as the y's here, well, the denominator will cancel off. So you get a non-trivial relation. You write down this relation, and what do you find? Okay, you find a constraint. You find a very non-trivial relation, which is what? I mean, it's very simple to see that you have a relation once you have this formula. And the relation is the following. It turns out to be the following. It turns out that, so you take the trace of the squares of the k's in the same combination as the y's here, yeah? and you find that this sum of trace has to be equal to 2g squared. And when you write this in terms of the masses, namely, you see now the k's are equated with what they are for the standard model. In the standard model, you get ratios of the masses of the various particles divided by the W mass. So that you can multiply everything by the square of the W mass, and you get a non-trivial mass relation. And what is this non-trivial mass relation? It turns out to be that the sum of the square of the masses of the neutrinos, the electrons, the up quarks, and the down quarks has to be eight times the mass of the W square. Okay? And now you begin to worry. <laughs> My God, in this relation, you know, if it would give you something like it's equal to 1, equal to something which is equal to 200, forget it, okay? So that's what we are going to look at now, very carefully. First of all, you know, we should know what these relations, where they take place. We should know where they are really taking place, okay? Because what you could do, you could naively take the actual masses that we know for the various particles and apply them to these actual masses. But this would be stupid, because we know that for the coupling constants, the relation that we wrote before, which is that G1 square, sorry, the relation G2 square, oh, sorry, G3 square is equal to G2 square, okay, is equal to 5 thirds of G1 square. We know that this relation is very, very wrong if you look at our actual energies, okay? And we have to be a little bit knowledgeable and look at you know why p physicists take this relation so seriously in ground unified theories. And the reason why they take them seriously is that what they call constants are not constants. Okay, you have to be aware of physicists. You know. So I mean, uh, uh, there are some things that physicists call constants, and they are anything but constants. One of them is called the fine structure constant. Okay, 
And uh, I mean, every physicist he sort of spends his life being haunted by this number. You know, I, I forgot what are the next digits, but you 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 must know. <laughs> yes, what is it? Uh, Zero. Uh, o O five C, I think, or it. Five, 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 six, 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 okay, good, good. Yeah, I think I, I remember that, yes. All right, so you know, this, what are these things? What are these things? Well, what happens is the following is that, um, okay, when you do um, the computations from the Lagrangian that we saw, the standard model Lagrangian, you find out that there is a problem, which is the problem that the final integral doesn't make sense because the terms that you get when you expand the final integral are all divergent. You have renormalization. And after a while, you understand that because of renormalization, all of these things, which we call constants, are in fact functions. And uh, they are functions of the energy level at which you work. And uh, I mean, the um, way they depend on the energy level at which you work is known. It's known by what is called the renormalization group. OK, I mean, we are writing a book with uh, Mathilde Marcoli in which we, we have a completely new, I mean, thanks to the work with Dirk Kramer also, I mean, we have a completely new approach to all these things from the mathematical standpoint. So I mean, you know, it would require a long, class and so on to explain. But I mean, at the naive level, you can just say that these are not constants. They just depend on the energy level at which you work. And there are known equations that tell you how they depend on the energy level. And at one loop, these equations actually can be made more and more precise according to what is called the loop number. And when you compute at one loop, the renormalization group equations for the coupling constants G1, G2, G3 are quite simple. Uh, what is written here are the uh, equations for quantities which are called alpha J instead of being, being called G sub J. And they are related to the G sub J by a factor. So alpha J in these equations okay, is equal to G J square over what? 4 pi, I think. Something like that. Okay. Huh? Now, so um, I always forget. I mean, you know, if it's 2 pi or 4 pi, but I think it's 4 pi. Think it's 4 pi. Do you think it's 2 pi? Maybe it's 2 pi. OK, well, well I, I'll show concrete figures very, very soon so we can check it. OK? So the, the beta functions are known. Yeah, I think you must be right because there is a 4 pi minus 2 here. OK, well, anyway. OK, so these are the beta functions. What, what is the beta function? It is, uh, if you want, in terms of the scale, it is a derivative of whatever you have, like gi, with respect to t. And what is t? It is a logarithm of the energy at which you work divided by the mass of the z boson. I mean, this is, this is irrelevant. I mean, it's the choice of a base point, if you want, the base that one chooses is the uh, mass of the Z boson. Actually, I mean, the, the fine structure constant is something like, uh, it's not 1 over 137, you know, it's 1 over 128 when you take it at the mass of the Z boson. I mean, it's something which is running, which depends on the energy scale, OK? So I mean, they are running, the alpha inverse, the alpha inverse are running linearly at one loop. But when you look at several loops, they are no longer running linearly. I mean, you know, if they were running linearly, you wouldn't have an infrared limit for the uh, uh, fine structure constant. And the fine structure constant is an infrared limit. I mean, it's uh, what you get for energies which are below the electron mass. OK, so that's a known equation. And when you plot the graphs, OK, when you plot the graphs for these things, you actually get the following, which has been, you know, used and overused for the ground unified series. So you get the following. I hope this graph is visible. OK. So you see, the, uh, this is what made the series of ground unification very exciting. It is that if you look at what is called the strong interaction, it's called strong because at low energies, the coupling constant is of order 1, which is extremely bad for perturbation theory. It's a disaster for perturbation theory. I mean, it means you know, that you cannot apply perturbation theory. Okay. 
On the other hand, it was noticed in the 70s that the theory is what is called asymptotically free. So what does it mean? It means that the beta function is negative, so the coupling constant decreases with increasing energy, and in fact tends to zero at infinity. So what it means is that it affects this nice shape somehow, which means that the theory is more and more tractable at higher and higher energies. Okay? In particular, it doesn't have what people call a Landau pole. So you can trust perturbation theory at any energy. Now, the same thing applies for the uh, Fermi interaction. Okay, and it is this curve in the middle. It's also, it's the SU2 gauge field. It's also asymptotically free. It decreases less, okay, but it decreases also. And, I mean, there is our guy here, which is, of course, the greatest one, okay, because it's very, very, very weak interaction. I mean, capping constant at our scales, and this is a great success of quantum electrodynamics, okay? So that's quantum electrodynamics, but quantum electrodynamics is sort of bizarre, because it has what people call a Landau pole, which means that if you keep going with this curve, okay, then eventually you'll be in trouble. You'll be in trouble because, you know, the inverse of this function will vanish somewhere. At positive, the function itself will have a pole. That's called a Landau pole. And it means the whole perturbation theory breaks down. Okay? So what happens is that uh, people who are doing ground unified theories, when they were starting doing the ground unified theories, they had the illusion that this little triangle was just a point. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now it's not a point. Okay? And it is, a, if you want, a witness to our ignorance of the physics when we go to that scale. I mean, which is forgivable because after all, you know, guessing the physics at the unification scale which is of the order of 10, here it's 10 to the 17 GeV, you know, because here we plot the scale in ordinary uh, uh, logarithm with base 10. So this is 10 to the 17 GeV, 10 to the 17 GeV from our scale, which is like, you know, Z mass, 10 to the 2 GeV, the difference is 10 to the 15. Now, I'm not a physicist, but <laughs> I mean, 10 to the 15 is like, I don't know, trying to guess, you know, look, looking at the Earth from a distance and trying to guess the structure of the protons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, which is a bit delicate, I mean, which is a bit difficult. So, I mean, you know, wh what we can do, we can do as if there was nothing in between and make predictions following that. But, I mean, of course, you know, there will be new things happening in between. And so, but, I mean, at least the predictions that we are doing in this way should be believable. I mean, they should be qualitatively correct. Okay, so I mean, uh, uh, this is not a point. <laughs> this is not a point. Okay, and uh, in fact, uh, what, what does it mean? I mean, but this is the same in all, you know, of these uh, uh, ground unified theories, except that in ground unified theories, then people add a lot of X fields and so on, so they can sort of, you know, fiddle around. And uh, I mean, you com some people will tell me that in supersymmetric theories, the three things meet, but they don't meet, actually. There is still a little triangle which is around. So even with a non-experimental knowledge, they still don't meet. So, I mean, it's a very delicate point, you know, uh, this point. However, it's not far from meeting, so that's all we care for, okay? So uh, 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 what it indicates, at least for sure, is that we shouldn't look for predictions of the theory at our scale. We should look for predictions of the theory around the unification scale. And then we should use the renormalization group to take these predictions from the unification scale and run them down. Okay, this is the strategy. Okay, so now we shall look at the second prediction that the model makes, and uh, which is the prediction of the X scattering parameter. Okay, and so how, how does it come about? Well, it comes about because, you know, in the, in the standard model, there was this quartic term for the X. It had a certain coefficient. And that coefficient was good enough to give you the X mass in terms of the W mass. In our case, we also have a coefficient. This coefficient is not hard to compute. And it's given by G square, the Fermi square, the Fermi constant square, multiplied by B over A square. Now, when you compare the two, what you get is you get the prediction for alpha H at unification. Okay. You get a prediction for that. And then what you can do, you can take the renormalization group equation. So, uh, I mean, uh, you know, when we write what we have in the spectral action, we do get uh, the X scattering parameter, we get a specific value. 
Okay, because we get, if you want, a coefficient in front of the H4 term. And after changing variable, we get certain value for this coefficient. Now, what is B? B was the sum of the force power of the quark masses and lepton masses. And A was the sum of the second power, like here. So A was given like this. B was given by the same thing, but with the force power. Okay. And when you assume, you make the rough assumption first, that there is a dominating top mass, okay, you get a prediction for this at unification. Okay, so you get prediction for this at unification, and then what you do, you apply the renormalization group. Okay, so you get this prediction. Remember that we have this one too. Okay, so what you do, you take the renormalization group and you run it. So what does it mean? It means, you know, that again, the, the quartic coupling of the X, which is called lambda, is not a constant when you run the energy, but it varies, and it varies according to an equation. And what is this equation? We'll come back much later to this equation. Uh, this equation has two terms. It has a term which comes from what people call the anomalous dimension. So the first term, gamma, is what is called the anomalous dimension. And the second term is a very important tool. Uh, it's uh, uh, 1 over 8 pi square. It's a one loop term times 12 lambda square plus capital B. And uh, okay, the anomalous dimension can be computed as this expression. What is this yt? This yt is the uh, Yukawa coupling for the top quark. Okay, so it turns out that yt is also running. Okay, and I will put the running of the yt a little bit later. Okay, so what you have to do, you have to solve a system of coupled differential equations for uh, uh, lambda and for yt. And for g1, g2, there is nothing to do because g1 and g2, we know how they are running. I mean, they are running according to their very simple one-loop equation. Okay, so, I mean, of course, you cannot solve this system completely, but you can put it on a computer. And now computers are so good that you give them a system of differential equation, okay, couple differential equation, and you tell them dissolve and dissolve, numerically dissolve this equation, just spit you the graph, okay? So this is how you get the graph, and what graph did we get? So we did that, and we got the following graph for the X. So we had the prediction, I mean, we had the uh, boundary condition, we had the boundary condition for the X scattering parameter at unification scale. All right, and then we run it according to these equations, and we got the following graph. So we got the following graph. So I, I, I mean, the value of the X at unification is given here of the quartic coupling. It's some number of the order of one third. Okay, and then you let it run. So I mean, you start at unification scale. You let it run. It runs down, and then it runs up a little more, and you get a certain value at our scale. Okay. And then from that, you take the equation which is in Weltmann, I mean, for the standard model, to have the X mass. And, uh, I mean, you, of course, you have to triple check the literature because people have different conventions. Some have a factor two. So, you know, ugh, I mean, it's a real nightmare. <laughs> okay, and a factor two would make a real difference. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you check it 10 times, you get worried because in some books there is a wrong normalization. You know, I mean, okay, fine. And at the end of the day, you more or less convince yourself that you are in a stable. <laughs> okay, and that's what you find. So you find that uh, at our scale, using the boundary value, which is in fact 0 0.356, which is sort of thin here, okay, at unification scale, it gives you a value at low scale, which is 0.241, okay, for this scattering parameter, and it gives you X mass, which is of the order of 170 GeV. Okay. And we also did the computation when we assumed, because of the CISO mechanism, that there was a large Yukawa coupling for the, um, for the um, uh, tau neutrino. And you find a very slightly different result. You find 168 GeV. So, I mean, the variation is very small. I also checked, I will explain that in my last lecture, I also checked that if you do the quantum corrections coming from the effective potential, you don't get such a difference in the prediction. I mean, it, it makes a very, very small difference with the prediction. So something like a percentage of 3 or 4 GeV, but not more than that. Okay, so, I mean, what does it mean? It means that in the present state of knowledge, 
being incredibly conservative. You know, this paper is an extremely conservative paper in the sense that we don't buy supersymmetry. We don't buy this, we don't buy that. We just take standard model as is, okay? And we try to make implications from this. So from that, you actually predict a X mass which is larger than what people believe. If you look in the, uh, the belief of people by looking at radiative corrections of things and so on, they believe that the X mass is much smaller. It's of the order of perhaps 120, 100, something like that. If it is bigger than 130 GeV, it invalidates supersymmetry. Okay? So, I mean, the situation is like this, that if you want, this model makes a prediction for the X mass, which is radically different from supersymmetric models. Supersymmetric models make a prediction where essentially the X mass is at first the Z mass, but then because of quantum correction, they bring it up to because of the top mass. They bring it up to 120, or with a lot of work, they can bring it up to 130. But you know, I mean, this is really the limit of what they can do. If, if yes. you look in the history, yes, they, they, they move, began, the, began they follow. Up, yeah, 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 of course, of course, they follow the experiments. You know, <laughs> they, exactly. I mean, they, they exactly, they follow the experiments. Okay, <laughs> okay. So I mean, you know, it could be that the X mass is found. It will be found in one year. You know, this is clear. And, uh, or a little more than a year, could be that people come out with the X mass of 120 GeV. Well, that theory will be in bad shape in the sense that what it will say is that the geometry of space time cannot be just that. It has to be more complicated, okay, because it has to account for a lower X mass, okay? Fine. But at least, okay. Now there is much more because the model also makes another prediction. It was making this prediction for the fermion boson mass relation. It, we had this mass relation, which was extremely scary when you see it first. Okay, so remember this relation. This relation was the following: when we write it in terms of Yukawa couplings, I mean, I, I had written it in terms of the masses, but it's better to write it in terms of the Yukawa couplings because all the masses are proportional to the uh, Higgs wave, which is called little v. And when you write the masses that were before in terms of little v, uh, um, you see the uh, uh, little v is equal to 2 capital M over G, where uh, um, uh, um, capital M is a W boson mass. So uh, one can replace everywhere the W boson mass and so on, and then you get a relation which is homogeneous in V, so of course you can divide by V. And so you get a relation between the squares of the Yukawa couplings, the sum of squares, which, as I said before, has a physics name. It's called capital Y2 of S in physics. It's a well-known quantity in the standard model, this quantity, without the V square. Yeah. And so what you find is that capital Y2 of S is equal to 4 V square when you simplify. Now, uh, um, so that's a prediction. So that's what you find, that Y2, you know, this y2 here is equal to 4 g squared. So that's a prediction, and it's a prediction at unification. And uh, now we have to see whether it's completely crazy or whether it makes sense. So at first, what we do is we assume, but this will be refined later. So at first, we assume that there is a dominating Yukawa coupling, which is a top quark Yukawa coupling. And so we just look at that. Okay, and the top quark Yukawa coupling is related to the value of the top quark mass by an equation, which is that the x wave divided by square root of 2 multiplied by the Yukawa coupling of the top or any particle is actually equal to the mass. So there is a running for the top quark Yukawa coupling, and this running has the following form. Uh, it is given by um, a cubic term, okay? And the linear term, this could be called an anomalous dimension also, okay? So there is this cubic term here. And uh, the linear term has certain very specific coefficients. How do you get this? You know, it's a manual thing with Feynman graphs. I mean, you just compute residues of Feynman graphs to get the one loop uh, beta function. Okay, so you get this equation. This equation is much simpler because it's not a coupled system. It's just a single equation, okay? And uh, by assuming that there is this dominating top quark Yukawa coupling, we can neglect all the others. Okay, and then if you want, we get a factor of C times the square of the top quark Yukawa coupling, 
which would be here, okay, which is to be put equal to 4 g squared g is a Fermi constant at unification. <coughs> okay. And we have to run it down. So we do that, plot the graph, and it turns out, you know, it turns out that there is a very beautiful normalization in physics, which is that the top quark mass by accident, nobody knows why, corresponds to Yukawa coupling equal to one. Okay, two fairly good precision. Okay. One Sorry? One percent precision. Is one percent pre precision, yes, yes. Okay, so if you know that, you get scared, of course, you know, because, I mean, what are you going to obtain <laughs> when you it take this it stuff? It's the way that you think, yeah. so it's just the escape. Yeah. So you pl plug it in the computer. Plug it in the computer. That's what you do. Okay, and this is where you get started, initial value. Computer runs it backwards to the uh, 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 W oh, meson, and you get 1.1. Wait, well, you will see. Okay. Okay, but then you know, so 1.1, you say, okay, it's an error of 10 percent. It's not that bad. Okay, well, we are doing physics. You know, would better be high. I mean, it's not like if it were 10 times, you know, something like that. It's 1.1, okay? <laughs> but then what do you find out? You see, and this we explain very carefully in the paper. Well, you find out that there is something that I forgot completely to mention, which is that there is a CISO mechanism which is provided by the model for free. I mean, the model spits it out. And when you do the CISO mechanism, you find out that you actually need to have another Yukawa coupling to be big. I mean, roughly speaking, if you want the CISO mechanism, the following type of mechanism, uh, it spits out the actual uh, masses of the neutrinos as uh, neutrinos have two states. They have an extremely massive state which has a mass of the order, perhaps, of the unification scale. And these are called sterile neutrinos. Okay, and there is another state of the neutrino which has an extremely small mass. Okay, and the reason why the mass of the neutrino is very, very small is that when you compute the eigenvalues of the matrix, you find that the matrix has two components. It has a component with a small mass and a component with a big mass. And out of the computing, I mean, the matrix roughly looks like a matrix like this. And, and, and you know. Now, if you diagonalize this matrix, it will have two eigenvalues. It's not very hard to imagine that the eigenvalues, there will be one of the eigenvalues which will be big because the trace of the matrix is capital N. But what will be the size of the other eigenvalue? Well, for that, we just need to know the determinant. Determinant is the product of the two eigenvalues. And so, because one eigenvalue is of the order of M, the other eigenvalue will be equal to the determinant divided by capital M. But what is little m squared divided by capital M? It's equal to little m multiplied by the ratio of little m by capital M. So that means that if this ratio is very, very small, the other eigenvalues will be much smaller than little m. This is called the CISO mechanism. Okay? Now, it turns out that to obtain something reasonable, you will need to have a Yukawa coupling, which is the little m, for the tau neutrino, which is of the same order as for the top quark. When you do that, you find out that instead of having only the top quark that was contributing to this y2 by a factor of 3 times its Yukawa coupling square, you also have the square of the tau neutrino here. So it introduces a factor of 4 third, because you, before you had third times the square, now you have 4 third, you see, multiplied by that. Now you have 4 times this. When you do that, you find that the boundary value is much smaller. It is here. Okay? When you run it down, now you, you get much closer. And now you can safely argue that the little missing piece, which is very small, is actually due to the fact that you neglected all the other Yukawa couplings, because they are there, nevertheless. Okay? I mean, when you consider at the low energy level, I mean, it's much better that you are a little bit up, you know. <laughs> if you are a little bit low, uh, that would be bad, okay? But you are just a little bit up, that's fine. It's perfectly fine. Okay, so in fact, you know, I mean, of course, we are not, again, I mean, to answer the question of Stanislas, you know, we are not pretending that we know all of the physics up to unification scale. I mean, that would be completely ridiculous. But what is nice is that these predictions are not stupid, you know. 
They are not giving you stupid results at all. They are giving you results which are in the right ballpark. Okay. And I mean, what is the meaning of this prediction? When you look back, okay, we didn't write this in the paper. I mean, what is the meaning of this prediction? The meaning of this prediction is the following. Is that it has a consequence. And the consequence is that the vacuum that you get from the non commutative geometry is the same as the Higgs symmetry breaking vacuum on the nose. There is nothing to do. You start with the Dirac operator on the product space. That is the vacuum at unification scale from which you should start. Okay? So that's very, very satisfactory. It tells you that there has been this symmetry breaking mechanism, you know, uh, taking place. Okay? And it has really completely gravitational meaning. Namely that you have broken the symmetry because you have chosen a given geometry. That's all. Okay? And you don't have to shift it. You don't have to change it. If that prediction were not true, what it would mean is that you have to move to another vacuum, you know, to get the, the physical vacuum. But it's not the case. It's, this prediction is telling you exactly this, that the original Dirac operator is already at the vacuum of the cell. Okay. Okay, so there is a last point which I want to discuss, and I will finish with that, which is the tadpole term. So this is a very, very interesting problem because uh, if you want, if physicists... Uh, have some motivation for supersymmetry, they have several. One has to recognize it. I mean, one is that they get a smaller triangle. Okay, can be discussed. There is another reason for why they like supersymmetry, and the other reason why they like supersymmetry, in fact, has to do with this prediction here, which is that they prefer, rather than making a prediction of this type, looking for fixed points of the renormalization group. And when you look for fixed points of the renormalization group and try to get the top mass, if you do it with a standard model, you get top mass, which is much bigger than what it is. But if you do it with a supersymmetric standard model, you get something which is more reasonable. Okay? But this is because they, they don't have, um, how to say, a boundary value which is given to them at unification. Here we have a boundary value which is handed to us at unification, so we don't have to have a fixed point of renormalization group. What we have to do is to run down the renormalization group to our actual scale. That's all. Okay? So it's different. Now, the real reason why people like supersymmetry, is another one. It is what is called the naturalness problem. So I want to explain this naturalness, which was, okay, a nightmare for many days because of a sign which, for some reason, I mean, some mental block, I could not determine. Okay, now I think I am pretty sure that it's right. But so in the paper, we were very careful. We didn't even mention it. <laughs> okay. okay. So what is naturalness? What is the naturalness problem? What is the fine-tuning problem? Well, the naturalness problem is the following. In the standard model, if you want to maintain, when you do renormalization, if you want to maintain the X mass or the X vacuum energy, if you want, if you want to maintain it at, at what it is, when you do renormalization, you have to uh, uh, play with a term in the standard model, which I showed you before. Yuck. Uh, I think I, I would have to be really extremely lucky to find it. Is it here? No, it's not here. It was in the middle. Okay, and this term, this term is what physicists call a tadpole. Uh, in fact, while I am doing that, I can give you a joke, you know. Because uh, Sidney Coleman, who is an incredibly witty guy, tried at some point to change the name of the tadpole. So he, se he sent a paper to some physics journal in which he had changed the name for the tadpole, but the, the change of name was not accepted. I think for politically correctness reasons. Because he wanted to call the tadpole the spermion. <laughs> <laughs> The reason, you know, <laughs> is that the tadpole <laughs> has the following type of graph. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, of course, you know, <laughs> his proposal was rejected. <laughs> so, there is a term in the standard model. I mean, I couldn't find it, you know. But there is a term which is uh, 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 exactly called the tadpole, which is a linear term in the Higgs field. It's a pity that I cannot find it because... And this term is incredibly problematic 
the reason why it is problematic is the following, is that when you write the graphs that couple to the x, shit, Ah. ah, might be, might be I put it there. So you see, when you write uh, the graphs which couple to the X field, you will find that, uh, yeah, it's here. No. Jesus Christ. Where it is? Oh, the tadpole has disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> I better drop that and find it. Uh, Okay, what happens if you want is that you have, uh, yeah, here it is, okay, okay, here it is, you see, it is this term here, the last one, okay, it is this term here, and you see that this term is linear in the X, it has this linear terms in the X, okay, so, I mean, because of that, it's called the tadpole term. Now, uh, unfortunately, you know, what happens is that when you compute the graphs which contribute to this term, in the Feynman graphs, okay, you find that they are quadratically divergent. So you find, if you want, that the X, in fact, there are several graphs. The graph which come from, the, for instance, the minimal coupling of the X with W and B fields, you know, typically what you have, you have a graph of this form. The X field is always written as a dashed line like this. So the minimal coupling with one of the uh, uh, fermion fields and so on, it would give you something like that. Okay, and, and you would have things of this type. I mean, this would give you uh, a typical self-energy term for the X, which would be quadratically divergent. Why? Because the propagator for the gauge bosons are, you know, quadratic. So you would have an integral with one over Q squared, which is quadratically divergent. Okay? <laughs> typically, for instance, when you look at the self-energy of the X also, you have a term of this form, okay, which is exactly, uh, uh, you know, the self-interaction for uh, a phi-force theory. Okay? And this is again quadratically divergent. And you have similar things when you pair with fermions. So, I mean, you are in trouble because what you get when you use a cutoff method, you use, you, you get terms which are quadratic in the cutoff. And they contribute to the tadpole, actually. They contribute by a quadratic term, which is of this form. What is the difficulty with this term? Well, the difficulty is that if you believe that fundamental physics is coming at a certain scale, okay, then you would have to know the value of that quantity, which is lambda squared times a certain quantity, which is order one, to an incredible precision, in order that its low energy value would be what you expect. Okay? You see, because, for instance, if you take the unification scale, the lambda square here will be something of the order of 10 to the 32 or 33 or something like that. Okay? So it will be enormous. And that would mean that you have to do, you have what people call a fine-tuning problem, or what they call a naturalness problem, that you would have to know this quantity, okay, extremely uh, uh, precisely. Now, it's not a problem which is as serious as it looks, actually. And there was a solution that was proposed by Percacci. I mean, you know, there are, there are several ideas of solution, and which are not far from the type of ideas that we have, and uh, 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 which I want to discuss briefly to end. Okay, anyway, what do we find? We find that uh, uh, there is a coefficient for this quadratic divergence. It has been computed it is in a lot of papers. And, uh, I mean, it has positive contributions from, the, um, from that guy. It has positive contribution from that guy, which is 6 lambda. And it has negative contribution from the coupling with fermions. Okay, and, and from the Yukawa coupling with fermions. Uh, yes. Okay, so at the end of the day, what you get, you get that it evolves with time, I mean, with, uh, sorry, scale, this Q, and uh, you plot it. So this is a physics coefficient in the standard model. And what you find, you find a very strange behavior. I would like this behavior to be confirmed, you know, I mean, okay, I mean, it seems to be okay. And what you get in the following is that you get something, this coefficient Q of T of the quadratic divergence. You find out that it's negative at our scale, but it changes sign. And the reason is that the domination of the top quark mass actually wipes out after a while, and after a while it is dominated by the uh, X scattering parameter. And the top quark is no longer dominating. I mean, this was clear in the graphs before. Remember that the Yukawa capping of the top quark was going down, 
and the Yukawa, uh, the, sorry, the, the quartic uh, capping of the X was first going down and then going up. Okay, so it's fine. So that's what you get. Actually, in our theory, we can even give a value for the value at unification for this thing because a little computation I mean, shows that at unification we can compute this coefficient Q of T and we can prove it's positive. I mean, here it's done from the experimental values. In our theory, we get it positive just from the computation. Okay? Now, what was our hope? And this is where, you know, there was this sort of bastard problem, which sort of a... <laughs> okay, I couldn't... I don't know, I couldn't find out whether it was right or not. I don't know. But it's like, uh, you know, the type of problem that you ask in uh, high school. You have a bathtub, and you fill it, and you ask how many, how much time it will take to, you know. Okay. So why? Because in our theory, we also have a quadratic term. <laughs> okay? We also have a quadratic term for the Higgs. We have a term, minus mu zero square h square, and amazingly, this term also has the same lambda square shit, as was before here. You see, in the physics thing, when you do the cutoff, you have a term with lambda square over 32 pi square times q of t. It turns out in the spectral action, you also have a term like this. <laughs> for free. Get it for free. Okay? With the same lambda. Okay? So now, the naturalness problem shouldn't be that serious, because instead of having to fine-tune lambda square times a thing, you just have to fine-tune the coefficient. Because if you want, they are coefficients with the same lambda square, and you don't care what is lambda square somehow. Okay? Now, the issue was whether mu zero square, which we had, had the right sign or not. <laughs> okay? And believe me, this is not easy. It's not easy because in the middle of the day, there was a big rotation from Minkowski to Euclidean. There was this, there was that. There is a fact that you take counter terms. Okay? Billions of things. And I will explain in, in, the, in the next lecture on Wednesday how to deal with it, with the, what is called the effective potential, then you can be sure. Okay, now I'm fairly sure. So because we are not sure of that, we were sort of fiddling around and trying to find out if we could change the sign of this coefficient by fiddling around with the mass matrices. So that's what we did. That's what we did in the paper. We found that it is possible, but it is possible under extreme circumstances. Namely, in order to do that, you are, first of all, you need more than two generations. That's okay, we have three generations. But you need a very, very bizarre circumstance in which the Majorana mass matrix, which is Ka, okay, has a largest eigenvalue, which is uh, such that if you want, when you take, so the largest eigenvalue, now you take it in homogeneous form, so you multiply it by the Hilbert-Schmidt norm, and you divide it by the quartic norm, I mean the norm in L4. And when you do that, then you look at the range of variation. What you find is that for n generation, the range of variation is from 1 to the uh, um, half of 1 per square root of n. So in particular, if you take three generation, you have a little bit of room. Now, it turns out that one can use this little bit of room to make this coefficient mu zero square change sign. But for that, you would have to arrange in a very weird manner the Majorana mass matrix and the Yukawa mass matrix. So, I mean, it was a little bit weird. So I will finish there by saying that, fortunately, you don't have to do that. And the sign that you get, which is a sign which is, you know, a natural sign, turns out to be the one that fits with the sign you get here from the uh, naturalness. So there is a hope, it would be a little bit crazy, but there is a hope that actually the bothering term in physics, which is coming from the naturalness problem, can actually be identified with the term that we get in the spectral action. Okay, there is really this hope. If that hope were true, then the problem of naturalness would disappear completely, actually. And in fact, you know, it would be a blessing, rather. So, I mean, next time I will discuss the other prediction for gravitation, for the gravitational part, and uh, I will discuss some kind of tentativo with Mathilde for uh, uh, the analogy between quantum gravity and uh, st quantum statistical mechanics and what the work we did about the Riemann zeta function or that. So it will be more speculative, you know, but on the other hand, okay, <laughs> why not? You know? Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Yeah.